believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. So there's a whole lot there. If you remember right last week, we started out and we looked kind of at the verily, verily, and he that believeth on me. And we looked at the verily, verily implied importance. And that was Jesus bringing emphasis. Amen, amen, he was saying. In other words, he was drawing our attention to the fact that this is very important. And if you'll go through the Gospels, you'll find that when Jesus says verily, verily, normally speaking, it's something that is very essential. I mean, he's talking about being born again, so on and so forth, something like that. And uh, so he draws our attention to the importance of what he's saying here. And then he says that, he goes on to tell us that we will do the works of Jesus. And he says that's for believers. That's for believers. That's not just for uh, the apostles or the prophets or, or some evangelist or some pastor. That's for the believers. He's talking to the, any born-again believer here about their prayer life. And as I share that, I've been sharing lately that, you know, one of the things when we look at the prayer life and the promises of God and what they tell us about what the, the impact we can have with our prayer, it's amazing sometimes. I mean, it's hard sometimes to wrap our head around it because the promises seem so great. And, and I touched upon that a little bit this morning, though, of the importance of our prayer life, the importance and difference that we can make by praying. And we, we can change a nation with our prayers. We can change the city with our prayer. We can, we can impact the entire world to our prayer life. The promises are tremendous. And we're going to look here at these, and I want to focus tonight on the fact and show you the foundation or the basis of answered prayer. Prayer is being answered is based upon the works of God and not upon the works of man. And that's a very important distinction to understand. Our prayer is being answered is based upon the works of God and not upon the works of a man. I can't produce answered prayers, but God can produce answered prayers through me. I can't produce, you know, I can't shake a nation, but God can use me as a vessel in prayer to shake a nation. You can't shake a nation, but God can use you and shake a nation. Do you remember right, one of the things we looked at this morning was that God works through human vessels. Just like with the Israelites. When the Israelites were crying out to God, they were oppressed. They out, God, oh God, move, oh God, oh move. God did move. He sent on Moses. And we found that many times. When, when uh, the, the Gentiles were crying out to God, God did move. He raised up Paul. And he raised up the church. And we can, went through several different circumstances and several different situations and, and looked at how God uses human vessels. When, when, when the Israelites were, when Moses was on the mountaintop and the Israelites were making a golden calf to worship it, and Moses went down, God's intent was to judge them. God's intent was to bring devastation upon them because of it. But Moses called upon God on their behalf, and God stayed his hand. And so we understand that God does work through vessels. But God works, accomplishes the answer to the prayers. God, when we pray, that prayer being answered, the foundation and the basis of that is the works of God. And I want to kind of dig into that a little bit and show you the completeness and the wholeness of how our prayer life and the results of that are based upon the works of God and not upon the works of a man. Uh, if you'll notice right here, in John chapter 14, verse 12 again, and let me read that again with that focus. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do. Why? Because I go unto my Father. So Jesus is saying, yeah, you're going to do works in Christ. You're even going to do greater works. Why are you going to do that? Because Jesus went to the Father. So it's based upon here what Jesus did, not upon what we did. Look at verse number 13, and whatsoever you shall ask it, my name, that will I do. So what we ask in his name, on the basis of what he has done, he will do. So when we look at it that way, it becomes easy to understand how God can do great and mighty things through our prayer life. And we're going to see tonight that the main thing that we're going to look at in our prayer life is our prayer life. When we go to the Lord in prayer, we are transferring from our ability to God's ability. I'm laying down my ability, and I'm picking up God's ability. I'm taking it out of my hands and I'm putting it into God's hand. Why? Because 
because Jesus has went to the Father. And he says, whatever we ask in what name? In his name, we're to say, he will do. Verse 14, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. So we see there that Jesus has made three big statements. That we're going to do the works of Christ. Why? Because he's gone unto the Father. And then he goes on to say that if we ask anything in his name, he will do it. So you see, all of that there that is mentioned there is based upon the works of Jesus Christ. So our prayer life being answered and being powerful is based upon the works of Jesus Christ and not upon the works of the man. You see, if I look at my ability and I think, well, I'm going to pray for this and I'm going to pray for that and I'm going to pray for this. And you think, well, I don't know, that prayer seems too big. Well, let me ask you how long would it take God to accomplish that two day prayer? Probably not very long, would it? If we realize He's the one doing it. If we realize He's the one taking place. You know, one of the examples that I use so often to illustrate this point was the time of the tax collector and the Pharisee in the Bible that Jesus talked about. And actually, they were in prayer. And, and the Pharisee was calling upon God and saying, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. I mean, I, I pay my tithes and I fast twice a week and I'm just do all these great things I do and pat himself on the back. And the other one is over there saying, and he says he won't even lift up his eyes. And he said, God have mercy on me. And we understand, and I've explained this before, in the Greek language, he said, I appeal to the mercy seat. And the mercy seat was the place that in the, in the, in the Holy of Holies where the high priest brought the blood and put it on the mercy seat. And that's where God says, I will meet you where the blood is on the mercy seat. And he's appealing to the mercy of God. So his prayer is based upon the shed blood of Jesus Christ. His prayer is based upon the works of Jesus Christ and what Jesus has done. Not upon what man has done. The other one, he's trying to get God to answer his prayer because of all the great things he's done. An answered prayer is not something we achieve. <clears throat> An answered prayer is something we receive. We're not trying to achieve, we're trying to receive. You with me so far? Amen. You remember uh, with Abraham and, and, and Sarah, and we hear about this a lot, don't we? Praying for the promised child of Isaac. And, and, and there was a couple verses there that are very important, and they're just one of those things sometimes we so easily read over, and we so easily just kind of don't stop for a moment and chew on it and grasp it. And one of the scriptures is in Romans chapter 4, and it says that Abraham was fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able to perform. So Abraham was walking in faith and, and, and believing God to do a great and mighty miracle. Why? Because Abraham knew that he could do it. He knew that Sarah could do it. No, the Bible's plain. He wasn't looking at his ability. He wasn't looking at Sarah's abilities. He was trusting that God was able to perform what he had promised. So when we go to God in prayer and we're believing God and we're laying God's word before him and asking God to perform his word, all we're doing is putting our trust and our belief and our faith that God is able to perform what he's promised. So answer prayer is based upon God's ability and not yours. You say, but pastor, you don't understand. I, I just got that. I can't do this and I can't do that. What does it matter? It's based on God's ability, not ours. Is God able to perform His Word? If God's able to perform His Word, then God's able to answer prayer. Is there a prayer that you can pray that's too big for God's ability? I don't believe there is. So we can't pray too big because we're looking at God's ability. And one of the things that will absolutely hinder us more than any one thing and beloved, this is so easy to fall prey to. Is when you begin to pray about something, and I know you guys have never done this. I'm the only one guilty here. I've committed things to prayer, and then I try to figure out how to do it. <laughs> Take it to the Lord, y'all laugh because y'all done it too. You get to the Lord God, you lay it before God, you pray, you, you call out to God, you're looking for God to perform a miracle, you get up for prayer, like, Lord, I'm a humble. Well, I can't do that. I stutter. 
God told Jeremiah to rise up and prophesy to the nations again. I can't do that. I'm but a youth. Well, God's not asking you to do it in your abilities, Jeremiah. God's not asking you to do it in your abilities, Moses. God is asking you to go forth and simply be a vessel that he can use to manifest his power and his ability upon this planet. So when we go to God in prayer, we're not, it has nothing to do with who we are or what our abilities are or what our strengths are or what our talents are. It has to do with God's ability. You see, you remember the 12 spies in the Old Testament where they sent them in to spy out the promised land? And we hear that a lot too. And, and they came back and sent out the 12 spies with this. It's overwhelmed. They couldn't do it. Well, we can't do that. I mean, the, the Malachites are there, and so on and so forth. They named all the ites and said all the ites are there, and, and, and you know we're just grasshoppers at their sight. How can we possibly win this battle? Well, God's not asking you to win. And the other two, Joshua and Caleb, said, "Wait a second. If we delight ourselves in the Lord, He will give it to us." <clears throat> so they were looking at God's ability and not theirs. One of the first keys to understand about prayer, beloved, is prayer is our way of tapping in to God's abilities and not ours. He says there that we can do the works of Jesus because we're asking in his name, because he's went to the Father, and he will do it. Everybody says, I don't see how that's possible, that anybody the works of Jesus can be done. Well, he's not dead. He's resurrected. He's still alive, and he's still the same as he was, same day, yesterday, today, and forever. And he's promised what we ask in his name. He will do it. So how would it be hard to do the works of Christ? Was he, he said he'll do it. So I'm going to figure out if those looks are good or not. <laughs> you know, we, these things that we allow to get into our prayer life sometimes. Turn to the book of Romans chapter 4. Hallelujah. And we're just going to kind of dissect a couple things here. Things that hinder our prayer life. Things that hinder our faith. We're not talking about your mobility. We're not talking about my ability. We're talking about God's ability. I remember one time a certain uh, other minister had come me and asked me to pray with him about some stuff, and he was just overwhelmed with it. And it was some finances. He was overwhelmed with the amount of finances. And I just asked him, said, I said, how long will it take the Holy Spirit to raise that much money? See, when we pray, we forget God's doing it. Well, how can we ever come up with that much money? Let me, let me rephrase that. How could God come up with that much money? Probably wouldn't be too hard to task, would it? How can we ever do that? Well, how can God do that? If you're committing it to prayer, you're not. You're letting go of it with your ability, and you're putting it into God's hands for Him to use His ability. Romans chapter 4. Verse 4. But one of the things we've got to understand is it's not based upon our works. Now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. And, and you've heard me teach along this line a while back. We went through Romans chapter 4 and did a teaching on that. But, it, but if, if I get up and go to work tomorrow, and I work all week, and Friday's payday, I go in, they owe me money. Companies have debted to me. They owe me money, don't they? They owe me X amount of money, whatever a person makes per hour. You work 40 hours, they owe you that much money. They are indebted to you to pay you that money. And that's what that's saying. If God, if God gives us answers prayers on the basis of what we do, then God would be in debt to us. Well, God, let me explain this to you, God. I've been doing really good. I've been acting right. I haven't done anything crazy for six months now. I've been going to church. I've been, I've been worshiping you and praising you and reading my Bible. So, God, I want you to pay me today and do this. And that's how if we go there with works in our mind and you think that's what God's going to do on the basis of what we do, that's what we're saying. God, you owe me. God, you owe me. I mean, there's a lot of people in the world today in our society who have a you owe me mentality. But surely they don't even go, go so far as they got us. God is not in debt to anybody, is it? We can go on down. And that's what Romans chapter 4 really brings to our attention. Look at verse 14. For if they which are of the law be heirs, 
Faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. <laughs> so if we can receive things from God by obeying the law and doing good, if I can go to God in prayer, and the basis of that prayer being answered is me doing good and trying hard and doing better, then there was no need for Jesus to come die. Because if that's, if that's the case, if I can earn things from God, then why did Jesus have to die? Jesus came and died and paid the price so that we can pray in his name. Not in Mike's name. If I go to him and I say, God, you know, I, I've been obeying all the rules and, and I've been doing the law and, and I'm doing pretty good. If I'm like that rich young little guy, I've been doing that since I was a child. If that was possible, then there was no need for Jesus to die. I can do it in my name. I can sign the check. But that's not possible. When we go to God in prayer, we're going in the name of Jesus on the basis of what Jesus Christ has done. On the basis of victory that Jesus has won, we're going to prayer and expecting an answer on the basis because we're asking in Jesus' name and not in our own name. And he says, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll bring it to pass. He might say, Pastor, why in the world are you focusing on this so much? Because I tell you, one of the things that, that over the years that I've come to understand, a lot of times when people go to prayer, they feel disqualified. Say, so what do you mean they feel disqualified? Well, they feel like they better call the pastor and have him pray because his prayers get answered better. Well, what makes you feel that way? Nothing wrong with calling the pastor. I don't like to call me and ask me to pray for you. Matter of fact, if you're in trouble and you don't ask me to pray, I'd like be offended. Why didn't you ask me? Uh, but a lot of times you feel disqualified. In other words, God, I, 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 I just don't feel like I can really ask you for this. You know, there's a, excuse me, let me fix my throat. We've talked different times about Heidi Baker. And uh, without going into a big explanation of who she is, but one of the things that she talks about in her orphanages is that when they first get orphans, they don't ever ask for anything because they don't feel qualified. They don't ever come to her and say, you know what, we're hungry, can we have something to eat? Or we don't have any clothes, can you, can you clothe us? She says it's a funny thing that after they go through the process and once those orphans are there, and once they realize they're loved, then they begin to ask. But before that, they don't, they don't feel worthy. They feel disqualified. They feel like they have no reason to expect that God would answer their prayer. And a lot of believers are that place. And a lot of times the enemy is bringing condemnation against you. And telling you all the reasons that God's not going to answer your prayers. Beloved, our prayers are answered. Because of what Jesus has done, not because of what we have done. So there's no reason to feel disqualified. Say, well, Pastor, you don't understand. I've been doing this and, and this and this. Well, quit. Repent of that. But there's no reason to ever feel disqualified in the prayer closet. There's never any reason to feel like you're not worthy to get a prayer answered because if you notice there, it says we pray in His name and He will do it. Now, if you were going to the in prayer closet and you were praying to approach a guy in your name, then you might be in trouble. And I might be in trouble. But we're not going there. We're going there in the name of Jesus. And we're asking on the basis of what Christ has accomplished. So there's no reason to feel disqualified. Because we talked about that last week, didn't we say in Corinthians 5.21? For he made him who knew no sin to be sent for us. Why? That we might be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The works of Jesus Christ purchased righteousness for me and you. We're right before God. We have right standing before God because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, not because of our human merit or our works. And that's the same in prayer. I have access to the throne room of God because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I can go to my Heavenly Father and lay my request before Him and expect and believe that it will come to pass. Because of the blood of Jesus. You with me so far? Are we on a roll yet? Let me show you that. Ephesians chapter 2. Let me read you a couple of scriptures. Let's get this out of the word. Realize it's not pastor making up crazy stuff. Ephesians 2, verse 18. Verse 18. 
For through him, we have, both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Why do we have access to the Father? Because we've done good this week? Because of what Jesus has done. Because of the works of Jesus Christ, I have access to the Father. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 12. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. So we have access to the Father. Hebrews 10, 19 says, For we have boldness to enter into the holiest tower by the blood of Jesus Christ. So by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, I can boldly approach God in prayer and lay my needs before him, lay my request before him, in the name of his son Jesus, fully anticipating that God's going to perform that work. That's what John 14, 12 through 15 tells us, doesn't it? If you ask in my name, I will do what Jesus said. I will see to it that it comes to pass. You see, it's an amazing thing when we really stop and think about this. Prayer answers are totally done by the hand of God. We're just a small participant in the whole equation. I mean, you know, we can look back before the beginning of time, and, and, and it was all that Jesus Christ was slain before the foundation of the world. The works of Christ were laid out and, and planned out, and the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ was, was set out in the Father's mind before creation, before you and I were born. The need was met, the price was paid. And the Holy Spirit's here now to reveal that to us. The Father planned it. Jesus executed it. And the Holy Spirit reveals it. And we just simply receive it by faith. And you know what else? Even the faith is a gift from God. Where'd you get faith then? Ephesians chapter 2. We're going somewhere with this tonight. we got a destination. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9. There's verse 8. Let's go there. For by grace are you saved through faith. How are you saved? Through faith. And that's not of yourself. It's a gift of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The Bible talks about faith as a gift. So we come to God and God's got his plans laid out and his son's executed the plans and the Holy Spirit's revealing them and he gives us faith to believe it. That's like delivering a car to somebody and say, well, I'd like to have that new Ferrari, but I don't have any money. Well, here's the money to pay for it. Oh, thank you. So when we begin to understand prayer, how can prayer not be answered? Unless we throw some kind of crazy unbelief in there. Or if we just understand the hand of God, then we're going to grasp something, aren't we? You see, Go to Ephesians, we're in Ephesians still, chapter 1, we're going to go there for just a moment. Because I go unto my Father's, where we started, that phrase in the, in the verse. <clears throat> because I go unto my Father, implies a couple of things. That implies authority. Because where did Jesus go when he went unto his Father? He went unto the right hand of the Father. A place of all power and a place of all authority. So Jesus, the one who is promising us here that if we ask anything in his name, he will do it, is sitting in a position because he goes unto the Father. He's sitting in a position of authority where he has all power and all authority to perform and exercise it when we ask. There's nothing that we can pray about that Christ doesn't have the authority to do. There's nothing we can pray about that Christ doesn't have the power to do. That's why he's saying, because I go unto my Father, because I'm going to be on the right hand of the Father with all power and all authority, you can ask in my name, and I'll guarantee you it's going to pass. I will do it. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. Which is this? It's talking about which he brought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Verse 21 far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also that which is to come. So he has all power. He has all authority. 
and he said, you have access to the Father. Ask in my name and I will do it. Now, both of us can understand that. We understand it. In Acts chapter 3, when Peter and John did, he says, rise up and walk in the name of Jesus to a man lame from his mother's womb, and the man walked. He was exercising authority in the name of Jesus. We understand it in Acts chapter 16 when Paul stopped and commanded the demon to leave in the name of Jesus and the demon left. We understand it with exercising authority. We understand that Jesus is on the right hand of the Father. Where we struggle is understanding that you and I pray from a position of authority and victory. We're not praying to get to a position of authority and victory. We are praying from a position of authority and victory. There's a difference. We're not praying to reach heaven. We're not fighting to get to heaven. We're praying from a position of authority that we've been placed there on the basis of the works of Jesus Christ. Why or no, Pastor? Turn the Bible to Ephesians chapter 2. You see, the part there about Jesus being on the right hand of the Father with all power and all authority is easy for us to grasp. But the fact when we go in prayer that we pray from a position of authority is a little bit more difficult to grasp, isn't it? We're trying to pray our way into heaven sometimes. Look at verses 5 and 6. Even when we were dead in sins, have quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So Jesus is on the right hand of the Father, and it says he's raised us into a position of authority and a place of authority. That's why Peter and John can say, rise up and walk in the name of Jesus. That's why Paul can speak to that demon and say, be gone in the name of Jesus because they're praying from a position of authority and a position of victory. We're not praying to get the victory. We're sitting in a place of a position of victory that Jesus Christ has already taken and placed us there and says, now pray from the throne room. Y'all yeah. looking at me. Is that what the Bible says? Just make it. Wake up now. Let me read it again. Just want to make sure you understand this. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 5. Even when we, that's us, were dead in sins, have quickened us, made us alive, born again, together with Christ, by grace are you saved, and have raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where's Jesus? On the right hand of the Father, in a position of authority. Where, where are we, according to that verse? We're sitting in heavenly places with Him. Uh, granted, we're here, our bodies are here, we're walking around, we're moving on planet Earth, but spiritually we are in a position of authority, at a place of authority. I don't pray to get the victory, I pray from a position of victory. The victory is only in one. That's why it says we pray in the name of Jesus. On the basis of the victory won. Oh, Pastor. If I can just pray long enough, I'll get the victory. You already got it! <laughs> oh, Pastor. If I just had, they give you $20, they give you $20. Oh, if I just had $20. So, why is it so hard to do the works of Christ? If you pray, in my name, if you pray on the basis of the victory I've already won, I'll do it. Jesus has got your back. A wise pastor once told me something. Stuck with me for years and years and years and has helped me through many difficult moments. He said it's simple. If you stand on the work, the Holy Spirit will always back you up. And I found that to be true. 
I stand on the word. I can trust that the Holy Spirit has my back. Hallelujah. Okay, what about prayer? What about this stuff? So, since you're praying, and I'm praying from a position of victory, the devil's in trouble, isn't he? Now, you do understand he lies. And you do understand he deceives. So if he can talk us out of believing that, then he can take it out of our hands, can he? If he can stop us, if he can get to our prayer life and stop us from praying, he can get us. Can he? I, I can quite use this illustration before. When I was in the army a long time ago, the three top targets for the, the enemy to go after, and I remember them well because I was one of the three. The three top targets was the commanding officer. That makes sense, doesn't it? That's why they don't wear a rank in battlefield. Two is the radio operator. That makes sense, doesn't it? Because if you stop communication, you, you can defeat the enemy, can't you? And three was a medic. I was a medic, so that's just not remember that one. Though. Well, those two get shot, I'm hot. Uh, because obviously, if you get with the medic, then he can't take care of the woman. But you know what? One of the things that the enemy has been successful at in many ways is robbing the body of Christ of the prayer life. Not only robbing us from spending time in prayer, but robbing us from being effective in prayer. And robbing us from this simple truth. That what Jesus says here, that if we ask in his name, he will do it so that we can do the works of Christ. And that we pray from a position of authority. Because he's already raised us up to sit in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. You see, the devil is a liar and a deceiver. And he can't rob your house unless he can talk him into that man. That's why Ephesians tells us neither give place to the devil. Don't open the door. Wise man once told me, Mike, don't put bullets in the devil's gun. That makes sense, don't it? If he's going to rob you and he's got a gun to go bullets, don't give him the bullets. If he knocks on your door and begins to sweet talk you, don't let him in. But that's, that's always been his devices, just like with Eve. God told Adam and Eve, you know, you eat from the tree of knowledge, you're going to eat, but you're going to die. Oh, come on, he said, you won't die. I mean, check out that tree. Check out that knowledge of good and evil. And he says, yeah, that looks good. He says, yeah, it'll make you wise. And in Hebrew, that will make you successful. That makes sense, doesn't it? Has a man fallen for that a lot? The devil says, I'll give you success. We have to understand, beloved, when it comes to our prayer life, that we not only have to learn that we need to pray, but we have to learn how to pray effectively. And, and, and understanding what this is saying here is very important. We pray from a position of authority. You see, the enemy will come in and try to deceive you, lie to you. I don't know about you guys, but if you've ever said, you know what, I'm going to have prayer time. I'm going to pray from 5 to 5.30 every day. I don't care what happens. The first time that time comes, somebody's knocking on your door that you haven't seen for 27 years. Phone's ringing. Oh my goodness, I haven't heard from them since high school. I mean, he got some kind of crazy trick in his path. And he'll begin to attack that prayer time. He'll begin to attack that prayer life. You go over there and say, oh, I'm going to fire that prayer. I'm going to pray in the name of Jesus. God's going to do it. So, oh, what that pastor preached wasn't true. He just had to fire up that night. He'll lie to you. He'll cause all kinds of problems to come your way to fill you up with unbelief. You know, one of the greatest understandings I came to them to a while back, and, and this is fairly recent. And, and I was sitting one day and I was studying the word, and I was praying over my, my teaching for a particular Sunday. And as I was doing that, stuff began to rise up in my heart that was contrary to the word of God. And I thought, Lord, where did that come from? Why is that inside me? 
And you know what the Lord showed me? There was stuff inside me that the enemy had put inside me, even way back as a child, that was contrary to the Word of God, that was fighting against the Word of God even right now. It's called unbelief. And he puts it inside of us, and things happen to us in life. We get hurt, we get wounded, we begin to doubt God. And then we come and we listen to some goofy preacher like me, so we believe God, pray in the name of Jesus, and God will do it! And stuff rises up inside you, it says, not me. And all kinds of reasons come up inside of you that tells you why that's not true. And some of them the enemy has put inside of you back when you were five years old. When I was five years old, I prayed for the name was Cat and died. Well, what in the world did you know about prayer when you was five years old? But so-and-so did this to me. They were Christian. And it's been implanted you all these years. Doubt. Unbelief. And he's been th and throwing it in you all your life. Whew, five years old. Whew, six years old. Seven years old. Whew, baby. Yeah, some days. Eight years old. Nine years old. And there I am, 60 years old, sitting in prayer with the Word of God open. And it's rising up inside of me to go combat what the Word of God is playing to say. That's why the Bible tells us we cast down imaginations and everything that exalts itself against that knowledge of Christ Jesus. And I have to cast it down and deal with it. Just like Jesus did with Satan. It is written, it is written, it is written. Sometimes, beloved, there is a tremendous battle to fight. But we have to understand what the Word of God says is true. We're to believe the God's Word at face value, accept it at face value, walk in it, perform it, and believe it. And I'll guarantee you those are stuff inside you too. I'm not the only one. Sometimes I look mad. You don't, you don't talk about the stuff inside me. Leave my stuff alone. <laughs> I've got some of those looks. I need to take to the Bible, right? Acts chapter 2. It implies that he goes to the Father, a place of authority and a place of power. It implies the authority behind the name of Jesus and it implies the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus going to the Father is directly connected in the Word of God to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 2, verse 33, that's what the Bible says. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, where's he at? At the right hand of God. And having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth that this which now you see and hear. This is Peter talking on the day of Pentecost when they've carried, they've waited on God, he's poured out the Holy Spirit, he's baptized him in the Holy Ghost, they're magnifying God in tongues and glorifying God, and Peter drawing their attention to this fact. This is happening because Jesus is on the right hand of the Father. This is happening because he's been exalted in that place of all power and all authority. If you remember right, in John chapter 7, when Jesus talked about out of their belly shall flow rivers of living water, it says that this he spake of the Holy Spirit which was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. In other words, the Holy Spirit was not given because Jesus was not yet exalted to be on the right hand of the Father. Jesus had not been lifted up and put into that place of authority and power. But now he's been lifted up and he's on the right hand of the Father. And these are the days of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Because I go to my Father, that place of authority, you can pray in my name. And because I go to my Father and on the right hand of the Father, I can pour out my Spirit and you can walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and do the works of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 8. Ain't God good? We don't have a clue, beloved. And the power we have in prayer. Man, I'm not making fun of anybody, but you know, we're taught that now I let you down to sleep, pray the Lord, my soul will keep prayer. Rise up and walk in the name of Jesus, prayer. Do you realize the authority and power that's behind our prayer life? When we pray in the name of Jesus, 
The angels stand up and pay attention. The Holy Spirit goes to work to perform God's word. All the heaven stands behind those prayers. The word of God stands behind those prayers. I think it out say, no. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Where are we at? Romans 8, 26 and 27. Hallelujah. Verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. He helpeth our infirmities. The Holy Spirit that, that we become baptized with when we're baptized in the Holy Ghost, the Bible says helpeth our infirmities. Now, we can look at that in a lot of different ways, and I think when you hear those words a lot of times, people think of it differently than it is. Well, he's just going to help me get through this sickness. That's not what all we're talking about. Helpeth. You know, our infirmities. Let me read you a definition of that word help or help and give me an understanding of it for just a moment. Join help, assistance afforded by any two persons to each other who mutually bear the same load or carry between them. Mutually, mutually bear the same load. Have you ever had a helper that wasn't on board with you? And they were more problem than they were help. Have you ever had somebody you were trying to have help you who was obviously they didn't share the same burden? Let me just give you a couple possibilities. Have you ever tried to get your kids to clean their room? Because you were burden have burden for their room to be cleaned. And you realized not too far into the ordeal that you didn't share the same burden. But they didn't really care that that room was clean or not. They were only doing it because they were, they were being threatened and intimidated by their parents. Or being grounded for 10 years or beaten or whatever. <laughs> but you're really, you, didn't, you guys were not co-laborers in that project. You were not co-workers in that project. You were compelling them to do something they didn't want to do. You know, years ago I owned a business for about 10 years. And, and one of the things that I had to learn as, as, as a business owner was nobody else shared my burdens. And, and, and a lot of business owners don't understand that and it really hinders them. Because you know what? Those employees, and I, and I tell the guy I work for at Parkside all the time, I say, you know what? At 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, when I'm off, I can walk out of here and I forget all about this place. I don't care. I do. I mean, you, you don't do that. Because your burden is different than mine is. That place can close down tomorrow and I don't lose anything. But it closes down tomorrow and he loses a lot. We don't have the same burden as a business owner and employee. <coughs> you know, I always have kind of financing. That's why I don't own a car. Other than that, I wouldn't work for you. I don't own a car. And I would. That's why I don't own a business. Because I don't want that burden. So there's places in life like that where we're co-laboring with somebody, so to speak, but we certainly don't share the burden. You see that in churches. There's times that many pastors get, get devastated because they don't feel like the people in the church share the burden with them. They don't feel like the people in the church share the vision with them. And they feel all alone. And so they get like Elijah, oh God, I'm the only prophet left. Why? Because you don't share the same burden sometimes. Or at least you don't sense it. And some churches you don't. You see, there's a lot of places in life where we're yoked together with somebody, but we don't share the burden. And, and, and what this Bible is teaching us here, when it's talking about the Holy Spirit helping us with our infirmities, beloved, there's never a time that you go to God in prayer with a burden heavy on your heart that the Holy Spirit doesn't share it with you. He's never, you're never going to be a co-laborer with him, with somebody that don't share the same burden. And that's exactly what that's saying. He shares the same burden with you. He's your helper. And you're going to the Lord in prayer. And he's the helper on the inside of you. And he's sharing that burden. That burden that's on your heart. You know, I mean, there's times 
like this, they, 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 this is so comforting. I mean, you parents, how many times have you ever felt like nobody had to work for your kids like you did? You feel that way, don't you? You know why? Because nobody does. <laughs> I, mean, they, they really don't. I mean, that's a different burden that a parent has than anybody else has. You know, nobody has a burden for my kids, even though they're grown. Nobody has the same burden as, 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 I, as I do. You don't have the same burden. You might say, well, pray for my kids. You might pray for your kids, but you don't have that burden. But I don't know my kids ask their heart to have that. I pray for them. But the Holy Spirit shares that burden with you. Whatever burdens you have on your heart that you go to God with prayer with, you have a co-labor and a partner. The Holy Spirit shares that burden with you. And that's what that verse is telling us. Help. That's what that kind of helper is. He shares the same burden. Infirmities can be physical, just mental, moral weakness. Primarily, not knowing what to pray for. You ever face that as you say, you know you're supposed to pray about it, but you really don't know how. What would you pray about this situation? I, I pray for the church. I pray for the congregation. I don't always know a lot of your battles. I don't always know a lot of your struggles. So how can I pray for you? But the Holy Spirit who lives outside of you does. He understands what you're going through. And so he can use me as a vessel. And he can pray through me for you. Because he understands. He knows everything you're going through. He Those times when you're... You're, you're all somewhere, you feel totally alone, and nobody shares the same burden, you're crying out to God, He hears you. And He can use me as a vessel and pray through me and pray about those things. And maybe not even tell me what they are, because it goes every groanings that can't even be uttered. It might be something that, not just me, but I'm using myself as a devil, that I'm praying in the Spirit, and I don't even know what I'm praying about, but I'm praying in the Spirit, maybe I'm praying for you, and something you're going through, and nobody on this whole planet knows about it. But God's using me as a vessel, or using you as a vessel to pray for somebody else. You see, that's one of the greatest weaknesses we face in prayer. We don't know what to pray for. Pastor, I pray more, but I don't want to pray. Well, the Holy Ghost inside you knows. Let Him pray through you. And a lot of times people have a problem with tongues. That's what the tongues is. Praying in tongues. I'm praying for something that the Holy Spirit's using me as a vessel to pray through me that maybe I don't have any understanding. And you know what? This seems funny, but maybe it's none of my business. He's just using me as a vessel. And I think, well, that's something I want. You see, let me show you something else here. Look at verse 27. You think this isn't powerful? You make these scriptures I just read over and I don't really spend much time with. Verse 27, He that searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints. So I just use an example of myself praying for you, making intercession for the saints, according to the will of God. So, I, I, Lord, I, I don't know what to pray in this situation. I don't know what to do in this situation. And God, you can pray through me, and you can use me as a vessel, and I can pray through you, and it can be in the Spirit. I can be praying in tongues, and I'm assured that when I'm doing that, I'm praying according to the will of God. Which means something. If I pray according to the will of God, I have a guarantee that it will be answered. That prayer cannot go unanswered. It's impossible. It's impossible for that prayer to go unanswered. Let me show you that trying to first John. Chapter 5. <clears throat> See, we've got to get this idea out of our head that answered prayer is a miracle. Answered prayer is normal Christian life. Jesus said, if you ask in my name, I'll do it. He didn't say it once in a while. Every hundred years. Every thousand years. Whew, every every five hundred thousand years, a great winter revival is going to go here that I'll answer three prayers. So we've got that in our head. To where so many people, I think, pray sometimes, are just going through the motions as if it's a religious duty, not truly expecting an answer. But I just read in Romans 
Romans chapter 8, 26 and 27, where it's talking about the Holy Spirit help us our prayers and help us our infirmities and groanings that can't be understood, saying that it's praying according to the will of the Father. So it's praying according to the will of God. It's guaranteed to be answered. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. And this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. If we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. If he ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Right? And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we have desired of him. So if I pray according to his will, I have an assurance and a guarantee from God that he will hear that prayer and answer that prayer. So if I'm praying in the spirit, I'm praying according to the will of God, it's impossible for that prayer not to be answered. If you can tell, I'll take a last picture. <laughs> Why well, it is impossible for that prayer to be answered? Why well, is praying according to God's will? You think the Holy Spirit's going to pray through you or pray through me and pray a prayer that can't be answered? That would be absurd. That would be ridiculous. But somehow or another, we've gotten so brainwashed by things and by life and by circumstances, we think that, that, that you know an answered prayer is something that happens every now and then. But beloved, the Bible tells us not only to pray, the Bible exhorts us not only to pray, but the Bible teaches us, beloved, how to pray effectively. The prayer life of the believer, I've always said you should be able to take any one of us believers, set us down in any city anywhere, and our prayer life should be powerful enough we shake that city because we're there. Yes. I, and I'm just based on that right there, just John chapter 14, 12 through 15, ought to be enough. If I'm here to tell anything, and I ask in the name of Jesus, Jesus say you're going to do. You say, yeah, pastor, I prayed and didn't get answered. Well, I don't want to finish you. But I'm going to go with God's word and not your experience, if that's okay with you. I prayed and didn't get the answer. But I've chosen to believe God's word and not my experience. I trust that Jesus is a greater authority than I am. That Jesus is a greater authority than my thoughts and my emotions. And if he says whatever I ask in his name, he will do it. And because of that, we can do the works of Christ. And even greater works than these, then I believe that what Jesus said is true. And I believe that what we ask in his name, he will do. And I believe that when we pray in the Spirit and we pray according to His will, we have an assurance that that prayer will be answered on the basis of God's Word. It has nothing to do with what I see, what I feel, what I taste, what my past experiences is, or what your past experiences is. I'm looking at the promises of God. And I'm saying on the basis of God's promises, our prayer life is the most powerful thing on planet Earth. Amen. Hallelujah. Johnny Jacks, come on, everybody. Woo! I feel a little fire in here. I'll behave, I promise. My wife says, Look, you embarrass me so much. I got it whatever. Okay, I don't embarrass her no more. It didn't take me long, praise God. I'm going to have to step it up a little bit, ain't I? No. Oh. <laughs> But beloved, I want to encourage you tonight. When it comes to our prayer life, maybe we just need to take a moment. And you know, the Apostle Paul talks about in the book of Philippians, forgetting those things that are behind and pressing on. And maybe we need to take a Holy Ghost eraser and just kind of whoo, write, write the board clean. I think, you know what? I pray and I've had good results and I've had bad results. I say this happened, I say that happened, and I've had maybe some experiences that have really allowed some doubt and unbelief to get into my life. But I'm wiping it clean tonight. I'm wiping it out tonight. And I'm going to go with God's Word. And I'm going to build a prayer life on God's Word.
word, not upon my experiences, not upon my grandma's experiences, not upon my aunt's experiences or my uncle's experiences or some tradition's experiences, but I'm going to build a prayer life on the basis of what God's word says. I'm going to believe God's word and I'm going to pray and I'm going to have an effective prayer life. I'm going to have a mighty prayer life because God's word promises that I can. Hallelujah. I let me down sing. No! In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk! Authority. Authority. Say, they're not hiding. 